So basically, I mean, if you look at the Darfur, that's the image that you can have from the public health point of view in Darfur. You saw food, water, health promotion, medical care, psychosocial care. And <coughs> you can do the same. I do the same, for instance, in uh, Pakistan after the earthquake. It's not armed conflict after the earthquake, but for, for the civilian population, I mean, the, who has to move out of the village because they were afraid of the, the earthquake itself, you find probably almost the same picture. And I guess in the two or three weeks, you will find the same picture in Haiti. And basically, we have to go through this strategy in order to maintain health of the people. So then the key message for this part, to reduce mortality by providing access to food, water, or the preventive measure. Now, the problem is, we know what to do. We have hundreds of guidelines for whatever health services to be implemented in emergency situation. Mass immunization campaign, okay, WHO has guidelines on that. Food distribution, WFP has guidelines on that. We know how to do that. The problem is, people sometimes don't have access to those services. And more and more, organizations don't have access to people. So then we know what to do, but we have very little uh, possibility sometimes to implement what we would like to implement. And now we have two trends, and I come back to what was saying this morning, you know. Certainly, I mean, there are sort of a radicalization of violence in warfare. Now. Uh, and at the same time, to counteract that, there is more and more a militar militar militarization of humanitarian intervention. More and more now, humanitarian work is done by military people. And organizations are caught in the middle of that. And basically, they are caught in between two things, insecurity and keeping neutrality. They cannot, I mean, work very closely with the military if they want to respect the principle of neutrality. On the other hand, if they want to have access to people, they are exposed to a high level of insecurity. And they have to balance this both principle to define what will be the strategy in a given situation. And that also has an impact on people, because more and more now we see an impact not only on health, but on the integrity of people. Basically, on human rights of the people, violation of human rights. And that is the second part. I'm going very quickly, so then can have a question afterwards. Public health and human rights. So I look at the human rights violation, and then the epidemiological approach, the power of health data. What do we mean by integrity of people? Individual integrity, social integrity. Example, individual integrity, torture, disappearance, sexual violence. For displacement, splitting family. That's, we see that now more and more often. It's become more, now almost, a manner of the warfare now. It's sort of a strategy of the warfare by the party to the conflict. First of all, I mean, there is very close link between both, because all of that has a direct impact on health. It has an impact on human rights, but an impact directly on health. Torture, forced displacement, all of that has an impact on health. So then, we have to consider as a professional, not only health issue, but also integrity, that part of our work. And what can we do now, practically? If we look at massive displacement, that's what we see at the end. Malnutrition, mortality. We refer to what I mentioned to Darfur, with the table that I showed before. Exactly that. Now, why it happened? Most of the time, for displacement. Why for displacement? Looting, harassment of population. Why? Bad behavior of the parties of the conflict, which lead to that. When we wrap all of that together, we have three dimensions there. Public health, which provides data on health, malnutrition rate, morbidity rate, mortality rate. And if you approach, why it happened, look at the causes of that, and finally make the link with humanitarian diplomacy. Try 
to counteract all of that by protection mechanism. So you see that everything is linked. And we have a contribution from public health to that. We contribute by providing reliable data on the situation. And this has a huge power. That's an impact of force investment in Burma, for instance, just as an example. Uh, if we look at public health and sexual violence, there is the health part and the medical part, looking for infection, pregnancy, uh, psychological impact, injury, whatever. And there are very good guidelines produced by WHO, MSF, ICRC on that. But also, more and more, we have this approach. Where it happened? Who is affected? When? And based on that, try to define what can be the prevention and protection measure to do that. Can go further than that. If justice come in, then health data will contribute to justice. The victim can provide evidence of what happened. So you see that everything is linked. And, and in that case, public health is linked not only to the medical care, is linked to epidemiology, is linked to the legal approach. So you have three almost disciplines going together for the same issue. Also, we can use epidemiological tool to assess or to quantify what are human rights violations. That's, for instance, a table from MSF. And uh, at that time, it was not frequent to have this type of table. We are more used to have a table with measles, pneumonia, diarrhea, and so on. But to have a human rights violation with number, percentage, and uh, <coughs> confidence interval, that was, uh, was, was a new. And I remember at the beginning, when we saw those figures, there was a lot of controversies. Do we need number for human rights violation? One case is enough to say that there is a problem. So, do we need number, yes or not? That may be just a question for afterwards. I have my own answer, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so then, as professional can assess human rights violation, we have the tool for that. And then contribute to the negotiation. That may be part of the answer of the previous table. If you come to the negotiation with whoever has a responsibility or can influence in the, the situation, and you come and say, we heard that something happened, you are on a much weaker ground than to say, so much happened. That's the percentage. So many people are affected. Then you have very good ground for negotiation. Dissemination of the rule, and also to give a professional backup to the advocacy process, to media and so on, to give really good, reliable information. And now more and more people want good information, not only just broad information. So we can contribute a lot to reduce, or to at least to mitigate, human rights violations. There are some ethical issues when we leak health and integrity and human rights aspect. If you are dealing with health, I mean, you can have good chance for collaboration, cooperation with different stakeholders, including government parties of conflict. You say, okay, we will deal with uh, measles, we'll deal with <coughs> malaria and so on. Okay, people will, people will listen to you, so can we work together? Now, when we work with human rights, we create antagonism by definition. When you have human rights violation, there is someone responsible for that. It doesn't happen like this, you know. There is a responsibility. And if you dig into that, people will start to be threatened by that. Oh, why are they looking for that? And for one organization, it's always difficult to have both action. And that's the example of MSF. You know, when MSF in Darfur uh, released a public report on sexual violence, then they went, <coughs> I, mean, I think the head of the MSF was put in jail for a week. MSF has to leave Sudan for, for a while. So you see, and at the same time, to leave Earth's activities. So you see, there is a dilemma when we deal with both. We have to be really sure of, okay, how far can we go, and should we go? 